The art world's full of nonsense. Um, it's full of smoke and mirrors, manipulations, lies, dishonesty, corruption, like a lot of things. But the art world is prevalent with this, and, um, and that's very sad. Hello and welcome to GB Talks. I'm Varun Bedino, Deputy Editor at Gulf Business. I have with me today Sasha Jaffrey, a world-famous artist based right here out of Dubai. Sasha recently painted a 17,000 square foot canvas, which is located in the ballroom of the Atlantis Hotel in Dubai. That painting was recently awarded a Guinness World Record for the world's largest canvas painting. Here's a look at what the artist does. Sasha Jaffrey, welcome to GB Talks. Thank you. Lovely, lovely to be here and thanks for having me. Let's begin with the school going Sasha Jaffrey. I believe you attended Eton along with Prince William. You were a biracial child growing up in the UK. How did those early years shape or prepare you for your career in art? Um, well, it's quite interesting, actually. Uh, I, I was an incredibly dyslexic child, like severely, severely dyslexic. And you know how... In those days, I'm older than I look, but in those days, dyslexia wasn't understood. So people saw it as a, tr a problem child or someone who was stupid or someone who was a trouble causer. They didn't really realize what dyslexia was. Now we know exactly what it is. We know how to help it. Um, and we know that some of our greatest talents have been dyslexic. Einstein, Beethoven, Mozart, et cetera. Um, so, you know, in those days it wasn't understood. And I was lucky enough uh, at a young age, I got a scholarship to Eton. And, you know, my parents didn't have the money to send me to Eton, but luckily I got a scholarship. Um, and I got there, but I was heavily, heavily dyslexic to the point where I had to wear um, these big glasses and one side was completely blackened out like an eye patch and the other side had like lines in it. And that's how dyslexic I was. It was like a wire in my brain had been put in the wrong slot. Um, that's how the the scientists explained it when I, I was studied and I was used as one of the case studies. Um, the head of dyslexia for Europe, she um, did a case study and she chose three people around the world. And I was one of them and she studied me and her, her sort of result was she said, one of your wires is in the wrong place in your brain, which means that your, um, our IQ is plotted on a graph and there are two types of IQ, you know, there's, there's the normal IQ, which you know, and then there's your social IQ. And the normal IQ, I was off the chart that way. I was like, they couldn't plot it, it was so low. And my social IQ was off the chart this way. They couldn't actually plot it. So Mensa's around 150 here, and the top of the chart was 200, and I was above 200, and they couldn't plot it. So they said, you shouldn't actually be able to exist in this world because you have these two parts of the brain that just do not connect, and they can't, you know, you shouldn't be able to exist. So. Eton was a tough time. Um, I was heavily bullied. I found it very difficult. Nothing really made sense to me in the world. Um, I felt disconnected, frustrated, and my dyslexia was causing a lot of problems. Um, and obviously having these glasses was causing a lot of problems. And then there was a moment, you know, that changed my life, which was thanks to Eton. And, and they said, they called in my parents and they said, look, we've got a big problem with Sasha. This was the headmaster. We've got a big problem. A lot of people in this school think Sasha is a genius, but as you know, there's a fine line between genius and madness. And my parents being two completely different people, 
my mom said, oh my God, Sasha's, Sasha's mad. We've, we've got a problem. I knew he was. And my dad said, hey, so my son's a genius. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's what they were like, right? Totally different. And, um, and my dad said, okay, so what do you guys suggest? You know, he's here, he's in your school. What do you guys suggest? What do we do? And the headmaster said, I don't know, but we've got a problem and we want to keep him in the school. But at the moment we can't, you know, he's way behind on academics. He's, he's not fitting in. He's, um, you know, he, he's clearly frustrated and he's causing a lot of trouble. So um, he said, look, give us a week and we'll work it out. And a week later, they came up with this idea and they gave me a porter cabin, you know, like a, one of those buildings you, you do when you're creating a big building, you have a little porter cabin for the builders to drink their tea. And they built a porter cabin for me next to the art school where we go to do our art. And they said, okay, we are filling this porter cabin with paint, canvas and easel. And we're gonna give you the keys and no one else will have the keys in the whole school. Um, so we don't care what you do in this porter cabin. We don't care what you get up to. We don't care when you're there or how late you're there. As long as you're in chapel in the morning at 7 a.m. and you make every single one of your lessons of the day. We don't care what happens. So I was like, wow, you know, the trust, the vision, the understanding that Eaton gave me to give me that space. And that's when my life changed because the only way the world made sense to me was with art, with shape, color, form, mark, and I just painted all my frustrations out and I reconnected myself. And I had the best four years of my life. The first year was horrible, but the last four years was the most incredible four years of my life. And I realized that I could paint, the world made sense. I then excelled. Um, and it's very weird from being the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the class, way behind. I then got into Oxford University. And I got an MA from Oxford, which is un unthinkable, you know, 10 years before, it was unthinkable. Um, and I got one of the top uh, double firsts in the country at Oxford University. So I don't know how it happened, but I know that that moment at Eton gave me everything. It gave me that foundation. And there's something my father taught me, which was something I'll never forget. And he said, always treat every man and woman the same, whether it's the king of the country or the janitor that cleans the loo, treat them with the same love, respect, and empathy. Um, and at the time it didn't mean much, but I've kept that code as the foundations of my existence ever since I've built on it. And I made sure that I live by that code and it's made huge differences in my life. And I think it's why I'm where I am. And it's with thanks to Eton, with thanks to my dad um, and those opportunities I had. Right. Breaking into the art world can be notoriously difficult. Um, it can be a snobbish world. It can be a world where young artists are shunned, uh, where sometimes they require godfathers or godmothers to help them break into the world. How did Sasha Jaffrey go from the porter cabin in Eton to the world stage, really? Um, so, the art world's full of nonsense. Um, it's full of smoke and mirrors, manipulations, lies, dishonesty, corruption like a lot of things, but the art world is prevalent with this. And, um, and that's very sad because in my mind, there's enough stuff in this world to shock us, to get us talking about issues, to think about political issues and agendas, um, to think about the pain in the world. There's enough catalysts that we have in the world to do that. Art should not be that. In my mind, art should be to uplift, energize, excite, and nourish the soul. And that's it. Art should be about uplifting the soul. It should be full of positive energy and love and emotion and honesty above anything else. And it should serve to uplift the soul. There are plenty other things that can do everything else. But art is the most sacred, beautiful thing in the world. And it's very sad to think, it makes me cry when I think about how what, how the art world's behaved in the last hundred years and the people that run the art world and manipulate it. And the fact that it's seen as a commodity, um, which is traded, that things are heavily manipulated and that things are hidden away so the value can grow. The whole marketing side of it is boosted up and it's seen as this commodity. And it's so sad that that's happened to the most beautiful thing on our planet. Art is a reflection of our soul. And if we're behaving like that with the most precious thing on our planet, 
then what are we doing with humanity itself? Well, that's pretty evident what we're doing with humanity. So that's very sad. So I try and put a piece of dynamite in that, that construction that we call the art world and blow it up, blow it apart and say, enough of the smoke and mirrors, enough of the nonsense, enough of the bananas on the walls, because it's a load of nonsense. We all know it, but no one speaks up and says it. And we give it too much energy and too much thought because it doesn't deserve much thought. Um, and I try and say, I want my work. The reason why there are smoke and mirrors in the art world is because if you try and make something with a very low intrinsic value and give it a very high value, you need a story, you need smoke and mirrors, and you need to make people feel inadequate. You need to make people feel you're, you're not intelligent enough to understand how clever this thing is and the value of it. And that's a load of absolute nonsense. In my mind, and what I try to do with art is make it as accessible as possible. Blow away the walls and the smoke and mirrors. Blow away the nonsense and the over-intellectualizing of something so beautiful and pure as art. Um, I try and say, I want my work to touch a child of four, a banker who's never left that world of the rat race and the, and the idea of making money, um, as much as it touches a grandpa who's 90 or a grandma who's in her 80s or a mother or a father or someone struggling on the poverty line, I want my work to touch each and every human being in that same way. I want it to connect with their soul. If you connect with someone and, and you shock them and you get them talking about something for a bit, okay, that's fine. You then put a high value on it, you sell it, makes money, people talk about it, but it doesn't last long. It lasts two months, three months. If you're Damien Hirst, you might get away with it for a couple of years. Um, but if you connect with the soul of one human being, then you're connecting with the soul of humanity. And that work of art forms the fabric, the threads of our universe forever. And that's what I wanna do. I wanna create a legacy which unites our planet, which connects our planet, which reconnects us to ourselves, each other, our creator, and ultimately the soul of the earth. And I wanna unite humanity because the issue is, for thousands and thousands of years, we've never united. We're a very tribal entity, humanity. But in reality, we're not. It's one world, one soul, one planet. If you believe in universal consciousness, it's the understanding that every mountain, river, tree, ocean, fish, animal, flower, fauna, every human being, man, woman, child, is one soul and we are all connected. And if you believe that, then what I wanna say is, I want my painting to inspire humanity to make a change, uh, to evoke a real societal change. We have an opportunity now to do that, to live with the understanding of empathy and love, the understanding that we are all one, and the understanding that if one man can spend 20 hours a day for eight months creating this painting, imagine what 7.5 billion people could do together. Imagine what we could do together. We've never united as a humanity, not in our history. But this is a moment when we can, and we can build upon that. And this is that moment to do that. So, you know, that, that's very exciting. And that's what this project is all about. That's what my work is all about. And I try and carve my path outside the art world, outside those walls of the art world, because that's the only way you can actually make a, a message powerful enough to break down all the nonsense. And imagine if we got rid of all the discrimination, the judgment, the agenda, the manipulation, all of that nonsense we have in our world, we disengage the ego and we united as a humanity. Imagine what we could do together. And that's what I wanna try and achieve. And that's what this painting is trying to achieve and inspire us to do. One man can't do this on his own, but I can send ripple effects around the world made a positive intention, which gives you positive energy, which can ripple around the world and hopefully inspire others to put something into their community, their school, their country, their village, that small area around them. And if enough people are doing that, we can change the world and we can give our children a chance we can empower them to change the world around them and we can heal humanity. Great. Um, I come to the 
incredible journey of humanity of which I can see right behind you there. Um, it has backed, of course, the Guinness World Record for the world's largest canvas painting. Um, I believe you worked 20 hours a day over 28 weeks, thousands of liters of paints, over a thousand paint brushes. Um, give us a scale of the, the human effort that goes into creating something like you did. Yeah, it was full on. It was full on. I mean, uh, I 20 hours a day, is, it's a big deal. It was actually eight months to create it. Um, and, you know, I, I had a lot of problems. Um, my spine, in between your, your um, vertebrae, you have like a cushiony thing, which is, <laughs> which for want of a better word, which is the shock absorber, which protects the vertebrae. And in two places that had completely gone, grinded to nothing. Um, because I'm bent over in a position painting, imagine a 2000 square meter, 18,000 square foot painting on the floor. That's the size of two football pitches. And I'm trying to cover that ground with the paint with high energy and I'm in a trance. So I'm not aware of what's happening to my body. I'm in a complete trance. So. Um, what happened was two vertebrae, they call it herniated disc, but in reality, what happened was two, two vertebrae actually just completely came out, locked in my, um, uh, you know, the nerves. And then it was getting very dangerous to the central nervous system, which meant I wouldn't have been able to walk again. Um, I would have been paralyzed. So I had an emergency operation, I had a rod put in and I had, you know, obviously various MRIs and, and I had to have an operation. Um, my pelvic in the midst of creating this. What's that? In in the midst of creating the painting. Yeah. So um, after about 120 hours in, I guess you know my spine like just fell out and my disc fell out and then my pelvis went out on both axes. My pelvis went out of line that way and that way. And when your pelvis holds up your your spine, your pelvis is like everything in your body. It's very important it gives you your, your alignment. And when your pelvis is out of line that way and that way, everything goes wrong. So my heels got disconnected from my feet. Um, my entire skeleton was just like, you know, falling apart. So um, I had an operation and, and the, the doctor I remember said, you know, the problem is you should have really treated yourself as a professional athlete and you should have been doing two hours stretching every morning. You should have been doing chirogenics and the, you should have been doing like ice, you know, at night. Um, because you're doing high intense work for 18 hours and that's not really very normal. Um, and it's like, you know, it's, it's a much higher level of intensity than a footballer. It's more like a rugby league player or an 800 meter runner. It's keeping that up for 18 hours. Um, and it's very harsh, strong, fast movement. And I, I don't stop for 18 hours. So that, had, that took a huge toll. But you know, the thing that got me up in the morning Every single morning, I was like, I can't do this. But I had a, a pain injection every morning, you know, like a, like a rugby player does often when their whole body's damaged. They have the pain injection and then they go and play for 90 minutes and then they're in pain and they sit in an ice bucket and, you know. But I had to do that for 20 hours a day. So I, I you know, had to have uh, painkiller injections. Um, and then I, I was in a trance and I would do what I do, but when I woke up in the morning, it was like, I can't do this. And then obviously we'd put a call out to the children of the world to ask them to send in all their artwork. And we got artwork from 140 countries of the world, um, millions and millions of children telling us how they felt in that moment of COVID-19. And it was an incredibly beautiful and inspiring thing because they were sending how they felt, which was fear, disconnection, um, anxiety. Um, they were scared. They were confused, but also they had a lot of love and a lot of hope. And there were some positive sides. They got to spend more time with their parents. They got to cook together, eat together and reconnect. And that was beautiful. So, you know, for all the, all the pain that, that COVID-19 has caused, all the families torn apart, all the, the lives lost, the financial crippling that's been felt by people that couldn't afford financial crippling, all that pain, I felt we owe it to all those lives lost, the families torn apart, to make a change right now. If we can't do it now, we'll never do it. And I knew through studying history for many years that that window is very short and it's gonna close very soon. 
And I thought, I need to capture this moment and create something that could inspire and evoke real societal change that can last, where we can then raise money to help the children in the most poverty-stricken areas of the world who have been most affected by COVID-19. And then we can change the world together. And I really believed in that. But part of me thought, it's not going to happen. And, you know, I'm sat here today and I'm just so humbled and grateful and surprised, if I'm honest, that that actually is happening because of this project. And it's unbelievable that it's happening. Um, the effect it's having, you know, we connected 2.7 billion people of the world. That's a third of the world's population. And the ripple effects that that's sent around the world, the amount of charities and foundations that are now doing things they hadn't thought about before, the amount of people coming together and reconnecting and realizing what we can do is amazing. So yeah, it was hard to get up every morning, but every now and then I'd get one of these artworks from these children, you know, from a child from the slum of India or Pakistan or Indonesia, or a child from a refugee camp in Africa or an orphaned refugee in the Middle East. And these children have nothing, no home, no parents, nothing. And they'd have that time and the inclination to create this work of art, to say how they were feeling, to become part of something bigger than them that united all the children of the world and under one vision, under one energy, under one positive intention. And it was a beautiful thing. And every now and then I'd see what they'd created. You know, we, we sent them here to Atlantis um, via the, the website that we'd set up. And then we'd print them out on A3 paper and the most beautiful things that they'd created. Um, and that's what inspired me when I saw what they'd create. I'd be like, okay, I can get up, I can do it. This means something, we're gonna keep going. And that's what really inspired every step of the way. Right. Uh, Sheikh Nayan, the Minister for Tolerance recently inaugurated um, or unveiled officially the, the painting. Um, does that sort of high level support from within a country you live in at the moment, uh, some sort of validation for you and for the work that you continue to do? Yeah, I mean, obviously to have His Highness Sheikh Nayan, um, the Minister of Tolerance and Coexistence, is, it says more about him, to be honest, than it does about us. Um, all ministrations around the world um, have made mistakes. And they've all made mistakes in how they've dealt with COVID-19, how we've dealt with humanity, how we've dealt with many, many things. And we've all made mistakes. But the beautiful thing about the administration and the royal family of the UAE is that they're not arrogant. They realize when we need to evolve, we need to change, we need to realize the importance of humanity, and we need to lead by example. And them supporting our project, and His Highness Sheikh Nayan being, being by my side when we unveil the painting, and the support we've had from the royal family of Dubai, of Sharjah, of Abu Dhabi, and all the excellencies within the UAE, and the excellencies being the ambassadors, but also the high level officials within the country and the ministers, them being behind us and helping to amplify our project says more about them than us. You know, it shows that they understand what we're doing, the sense of humanity, the sense of uniting us as one world. Um, we're humbled by it. We're humbled by their support and it will help the project. But I think it says a lot about them. It's that understanding of, not being arrogant and realizing that no man or woman is more important and that every man and woman matters on this earth. And that understanding of one world, one soul and one planet, uniting to make a difference, uniting to help the children of the world. And that's what we've done together. And we're, we're grateful for Sheikh Nayan's support. We've obviously linked with our charity partners, um, His Excellency Tarek Al Gurgs, Dubai Cares, which is part of Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum's global initiatives, um, and one of the greatest charities in the world. It's the largest educational NGO in the world. They help more children than people realize around the world, thanks to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed and His Excellency Tarek Al Gurg, and what Dubai's care, Dubai Cares do. So that's our first charity partner. Our second charity partner, is Eva Longoria and Maria Bravo's The Global Gift Foundation. They do 12 huge galas around the world every year and they raise enormous amounts of money, but they give it to all the different causes that are needed around the world. So they are very prevalent 
in our partnership. Our other charity partners are UNICEF. We all know what they do. They have the logistics and UNESCO. They bring in the education, but it's what happens off the back of that. And a $2 billion fund has been raised off the back of this project through the GIGA project, through the UN, through the UN Secretary General, through six UN agencies, two private banks, the World Bank, huge fund has been raised. And the, the aim of that is to then put the internet in every single one of the poorest communities of the world. That's the aim here. The biggest divide in the world at the moment is those with the internet and those without. And we're gonna put the internet in every single one of the poorest communities of the world. The refugee camps of Africa, of the Middle East, of Eastern Europe, of Southeast Asia, the favelas of South America, they desperately need our help. The um, townships of South Africa, the shanties, the slums of India, Pakistan, Indonesia, areas within the Philippines, areas within the poorest and most in need parts of the world that really need our help, where unless we do something, 200 million children are gonna die in the next year. That, that, that just gives you an understanding of the situation. So first we have to keep them alive. We keep them alive by helping them with sanitation, water, food, clothing, and shelter. No one cares about the internet if they're dead. So first we keep them alive. That's with our four charity partners, the money we raise, and all the logistical help we've had. But then interestingly, through all the work we've been doing with the ministries of education around the world, connecting with 140 countries, and the work that these governments have been doing during COVID-19 to enable online learning. That's been a, a huge positive of COVID-19 is the development of online learning. Now that gives us an opportunity because that means with our partners, Facebook and Google, who are now gonna help us implement this alongside UNICEF, the GIGA project, UNESCO, the Global Gift Foundation and Dubai Cares. And UNESCO are prevalent because they bring in the educational side then the governments and the um, ministers of education, we bring the internet into every single one of these poorest communities. Medical hubs that provide inoculations, vaccines, sanitation, basic healthcare to keep these children alive, and then the internet. And through the internet, we then bring in an educational platform that we've never had before, whereby instead of learning para-English on wooden benches and just repeating words, they're actually gonna have a proper education and sit proper exams and have an opportunity to actually sit a proper exam. And with the fund, we provide laptops, iPads, computers for these children and a center where they can go. And then that gives them a real opportunity to, uh, that gives them a real opportunity to sit a proper exam in their school and then to get into university. And why not? If they get into a proper school in their country through the education platform in the, with the internet, then they can get into university. And you could have a child from the slum of India who has nothing, or an orphaned refugee from Africa or the Middle East, becoming a human rights lawyer at Columbia University. And where are they gonna put that? Back into their community. That's their DNA, that's how they're built. So all we need is five success stories from each of these communities, and we can change the world. For the first time in history, we can actually change the world with the will, with the right partners, we can actually make a serious difference. And we can do it by empowering these children to change the world around them, because that's the only way we can do it. One man, one painting cannot do it alone. But with this exclusive, unique partnership, we're gonna do it and we're gonna change the world. Sasha, your previous clients have included the likes of Barack Obama, George Clooney, Leonardo DiCaprio, and, and many, many more. Were some of these commission pieces, uh, I believe you don't go through dealers, uh, you go direct, you, you don't believe in being represented, you meet with the clients of all your top clients, you don't just, you know, make sure they're not flipping it and making a handsome margin overnight. Um, you know, what can you tell us about some of these? Yeah, uh, I mean, look, as I've said before, that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in the art world. So I've never signed, in my 25 years, I've never signed with a gallery um, because I want to carve a different path. And to do that, you've got to stand alone. Um, I've had beautiful relationships with galleries, um, but I've never signed with a gallery um, because then you become part of that machine. And I, I want to build real relationships with my collectors and my clients around the world. And I want to choose who owns my work. 
I say no to 90% of people that want to buy my work because I don't want people to have my work and then put it in a vault and then sell it five years later and make money. You know, that's like completely everything I'm against. So I want my work to touch someone deeply in their soul. I want them to love it for the right reasons. I want them to share it with the world, show it in museums, show it in their home, share it with people, with love, with empathy, with humanity. And I want to build real relationships. And I'm lucky enough that after 25 years of doing that, I built some really, really important, powerful and poignant relationships with people that I've had for 20 years. And that's meant that I'm in a position where I am today to do what we've been able to do. Um, and for that, I'm forever grateful. Right. And, and yet, yet. I'm sorry, I'm being called by someone's telling me I got to go. How many questions do you have left? Uh, I'm down to the last three ones. There's three. Yeah, but... I think they're saying I've got another interview, which is they've been waiting half an hour. So okay. if we, we'll do it quick, I'll give you short answers. Okay, fine. So Sorry just, that. all right, no problem. Um, just to stay on to the same topic that we, what we were just talking about. Uh, recently, I believe, or on the near, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, a painting of Virat Kohli was bought and flipped for millions overnight. Uh, that's <laughs> something that happened inadvertently. So as much as you try to fight the machine, there's always be those sort of the gray market, not really the gray market, but the secondary market that All doesn't right. respect what, what you want to do. Okay, so I'll explain that very quick. The battery also on this thing is down to 2%. So I'm going to be, now it's 1%. I'll be really quick. Oh. Okay. okay, so yes, of course, you can't always control it. You do your best and you try and choose who buys your work. But what happened was someone bought my painting. It was the Virat Kohli painting. I think they bought it for $350,000 and they resold it in auction for 2.9 million pounds, $4.5 million, but. And how long after that? I, very short, three, four months. Um, but, you know, that's what happens in the art world when you create something poignant and special. But look, I got lucky because the lady that bought it is one of the biggest philanthropists in the world. She's an incredible woman and she does a lot for the children of India and the slums of India. Um, and in a way that story ended really nicely because I met another client, another person. We're now together, we're doing things in the slums of India, we're helping as much as we possibly can. And she's an amazing lady and they're an amazing family and I've got to know them because of that transaction. And that's a beautiful thing. So everything happens for a reason and luckily that, that turned out well. One man can spend 20 hours a day for seven months creating this painting. Imagine what 7.5 billion people could do together. Humanity inspired. Thank you very much, Sasha, for joining us. It was really, really great having you on our show. Thank you for making the time for us. And thank you to each one of you who have joined us to watch this special session with Sasha. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed putting this together. Do remember to follow us on all our social media channels across Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you and goodbye.